Folks, welcome back inside the Parisi Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Coming to you live on Power Talk Live. Please go to powertalk.live and download our free app. Most everybody's got a smartphone today and uh, just stream away all of our live local shows. Completely progressive extraterrestrial radio. We're so happy to have you part of the program today. And it is great to bring back a, a dear friend of the show. He stateside. Last time we talked to him in Australia prior to uh, some pretty intense surgery, but this cat overcame it, and he's just been on a, he's been on almost a honeymoon uh, for the last month or so, maybe more, uh, and he's here to talk about it again. Sam Cutler, welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you, Jake. Good to be with you. Yeah, good to be anywhere at my age, as Keith Richards always says, you know. Well, I yeah. mean, yeah, I mean, for you, though, I mean, yeah, I, I just, uh, truthfully, can you can you, can you you talk, uh, not so much about, obviously you're in good health, or you wouldn't have made the trip, yeah. but, but how did the, how do you go in, how do you go into something, this he- uh, surgery, and how do you prepare yourself, and ultimately, how, how rigorous a uh, rehab did you have? Well, I mean, I had lung cancer just over a year ago, and they operated on my lung, you know, took the bad bit out, and then I had uh, chemo and uh, radiation stuff, you know. And then just, uh, what, eight weeks ago, I had uh, colon cancer, so they operated on that. Luckily, I didn't have to have any of the other stuff. Um, Man, you know, I've had a lot of operations over the years. I just, you know, I'm just grateful that we've got skillful surgeons in Australia that can do this stuff. You know, I, I don't have any particular secrets. I I mean, I remain positive at all times, if that's a secret. You know, I try and, I mean, I was out of bed the day after I had the operation, and I, I, yeah, I try and get well as fast as is humanly possible, you know. Absolutely. And, reach, you know, just maintain a positive attitude to it all. Given that, yeah, in the end, I guess we're all going to die. You know what I mean? That's one uh, death and taxation is one thing that's going to happen to us all. <laughs> so, you know, I don't get depressed about it, man. I get into it, do it, and uh, who's, you know, I've just been unfortunate in some respects so that I've had a lot of ill health in my life, but on other levels, I've managed to survive it. And what don't kill you makes you stronger. Hell yeah, baby! And it's so good to hear your voice. And, uh, um, I, I, you know, can you talk about? maybe um one of the most surprising i mean you have you you've had a lot of been doing a lot of uh moving around on the west coast but uh mm-hmm. can you can you talk about kind of a, a seminal experience you've had when you since you come back to the states well i mean one of the beautiful things that's uh, happened is that we met up with uh Ramblin jack elliott who's a dear old friend of mine and an absolute national treasure of america if ever there was one totally and I've known Jack since I was 15 years old, you know, and uh, he told me a lovely story. He said, uh, yeah, he was uh, he was in um, England way back in the 50s, yeah, and he was sitting on a railway station, and there were kids on the other platform opposite him, and he had his guitar, and nothing was going on. He was waiting on his bloody train that never seemed to come. So he decided to play the guitar. He took out his guitar and played the guitar to the kids on the other platform. Anyway, cut... Uh, cut a few thousand years forward and uh, he was in New York <laughs> and somebody said to him, hey man, would you like to go and meet Mick Jagger? So I said, yeah, that'd be cool. You know, So they went to see Mick in his flash hotel suite. Mick was very gracious and everything. He was very pleased to meet Jack and then told Jack he was on this railway platform when he was 12 years old and an American guy with a hat, you know, a cowboy hat, started playing guitar on the other side of the uh, railway line and he was so blown away about it, he went home and asked his parents for a guitar. And the following day, they got him a guitar, and the rest is history. Wow. wow. Isn't that great? Well, that's, so, well, that's, man, that's, that's, yeah, that's... that's and Jack Elliott turned Mick on to the guitar, and, uh, yeah. Well, that guy's really, really I mean, he, I mean special. thousands and thousands of, of years uh, with, the, I mean, just endless, endless, timeless music, uh Going back to the days of uh, when I interviewed Ramblin' Jack, he talked about, uh, uh, you know, basically going down to in New York, going down to Philadelphia and uh, seeing a bartender cracking jokes and, uh, you know, actually playing at this bar. And then um, it, he found out later it was uh, it was Cos- Bill Cosby. And then, right. and then and then there it is, Cosby, the first first gig Cosby had as a stand up comedian. He opened for Ramblin' Jack at the Gaslight. 
So, I mean, the guy has just been an inspiration, right place, right yeah. time for for uh he's for been me. around a long time that's for sure he knows everyone i mean he was with woody guthrie he was with dylan all kinds of people he's an extraordinary chap yeah dear I, friends with everyone he never you know one thing i love about him he never has a bad word to say about anyone never i've never heard a bad. i mean i've known jack since i was 15 years old i'm 73 i've never ever heard jack say a bad word about anyone which is quite something, really, in uh, in our business, you know. Yeah, I mean, he has a uh, he just uh, there's a fearless quality to him too. I mean, I I I mean I, but but it is admirable because I mean, even in the best of people, it sometimes can get the better of them. Did you um can you know one guy that Jack was very close with was a guy that that uh, ran the lion's share in San Anselmo. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have a feeling that that Sam Cutler was very involved because I'm looking at, uh, I, I, you know, the Jerry Merle amalgamations uh, with, yeah. with Martin Fierro. Uh, and, uh, That's right. And, we did all those shows. Kreutzmann. But I know Ramblin' Jack was very close with that cat, too. And then obviously mm. the Sons of Champlin played there. You want to talk about um, when you got over to the – I was so riveted and I transcribed that whole thing about where you came in. Jerry kind of wanted to have a – you know, three different, you know, cats running the show. But, you know, in, in many ways, Sam Cutler refined the, the Grateful Dead into a group that was playing a lot, making money. But one of these venues that kind of is, is in lore is this uh, Lion's Share. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how you connected with... Well, with the Lion's Share was this, just this perfect little club in Marin County, you know, that the local musicians love to play at. You know, it, there was a much more kind of family feel in Marine County. You didn't have to be a multi-millionaire to live in Marine County back in the early 70s. Basically, hippies, you know, had left, I mean, so-called hippies, if you like, had left San Francisco at the end of the so-called summer of love. You know, it was just degenerating and getting unsustainable. Too many people in too small a place. So they discovered, uh, yeah, they discovered Marine County. And Marine County had all these sweet little bars, none of which were really making much money. But, um, yeah, the perfect places for bands to play. And it became, um, the lion's share was very special for a few years there. You know, there's another place over in Berkeley that I can't think of the name right this second that Jerry used to play. Jerry loved small bars. I mean, he, you know, he did his thing with the Grateful Dead, of course, but what he actually really enjoyed doing was playing rock and roll standards, jazz standards, anything he could fancy um, in a small bar with, you know, 100 people in front of him. That was his idea of heaven. You get so intimate, you know, in situations like that, and musicians can see who they're playing to, you know what I mean? And they can see the responses from people. So it's really rather special. So and that was Jerry. No, Sorry, I mean, you know, Jerry. I mean, to me, Garcia. Uh, did you hip him to any any uh, like uh, we talked last time about uh, Skiffle? But uh, I mean, I, I'm just curious about uh, your musical taste and and if uh, if you brought some stuff to Jerry's ear that he was. I mean, he was always his ears were always open. You know, he was always wanted to learn. Oh yeah, but I mean, I wouldn't. I mean, man, I, <laughs> in the wildest stretch of the imagination, I couldn't turn Jerry on to any music. He already knew all the music I knew and more, you know. And the guy was like a, an encyclopedia of um, of music, you know. And then, of course, he loved to play all kinds of different things from American standards to, you know, Jerome Kerr, whatever. All kinds of stuff that he uh, he adored, you know. I mean, Jerry was very cultured cat and then you went from American folk music to uh, labor songs everything you know it's true I, I, just, everything. I mean I, I listen to uh, stuff and I, I always think about you because uh, you know uh, it, it, they were playing like uh, uh, all blues uh, they were playing miles tunes and I just like do you think Bill Kreutzman could have been a, a jazz drummer I think he's a mate, I don't know about that, because I'm not, you know, qualified to judge as it were, but I do think that Bill is a brilliant, brilliant drummer. I mean, for me, there's only ever been two really great groove drummers, you know. One is Bill and the other is Charlie Watts. They're both, 
<laughs> very, very special drummers, you know. Bill's kind of turned into a bit of a power drummer now, but he always was a very strong drummer, but he swings, you know. It's like they say, if it, you know, if it don't swing, it don't mean, mean a thing. He, he, to me, kept the Grateful Dead just there, you know, rhythmically. Uh, Mickey's a kind of punctuation guy, you know. Well, I want to. I want, I want, this is so important because I, when I listened, the the time period of the Dead that I listened to is is after you were gone. It's the early eighties. Eighties. Mm -hmm. Billy had become more. I think it was. It's very well put. He he became more of a power drummer. But as somebody who was like right there when he in seventy four when Mickey mm -hmm. when Mickey had to step aside for a minute, can you talk about the how Bill? kept it together and like you said swung the band how did he do that because lesh was out of control soloing jerry was soloing bobby was just bobby in some ways held it together too but as, as a solo drummer when i talk to younger cats on the scene today whether they're mm. you know i've talked to chris robinson's uh, drummer uh tony leone and you know it's like mm. you know they listen to that 74 period and it's just i mean it's just unbelievably swinging stuff can you can you talk about that 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 finesse but yet power that billy was displaying at that time well yeah i mean i think you know G billy it's a kind of freedom for a drummer if you've got all those guys in front of you like we're in the grateful dead so you're not necessarily being restricted to you know just you and the bass player doing a kind of conventional rhythm section trip you know oh yeah you i mean nobody's telling you what to do you could do what you feel like but i think that what uh, my observation of billy was that billy was always jerry's drummer billy was con he looked at jerry all the time and looked to jerry for the leads and you know supported jerry he was a brilliantly supportive drummer he is to this day all the great drummers are all the great drummers aren't really flash they're just there, you know, and the whole thing sits comfortably on them. It doesn't give you indigestion, you know what I mean? It's just like, <laughs> and if you remove them, it would only be kind of half a meal, you know? Sure, sure. And, and I mean, I've listened, of course, like everybody else, I mean, i listened to The Grateful Dead for many, many years. But really, the, um, the fact of the matter is that if you listen to them over a long period of time, the one constant that has kept it all moving along has been Billy. I think he's a very underrated drummer. I, I think uh, you're. Not, I think by, you're not by deadheads, of course, but you know, but just by people in general. Oh, I think you're spot on because I, I mean, even musician friends that I, my peers, they they listen to it, and I, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe Watts could have done it, but. I mean, Billy held that together because if you did, if you, it would have been a mess if you, if you, if you, you know, yeah. it, it was hard to do. But you see, it is, um, it is quite extraordinary, isn't it? The, the you know, four, four or five people get together, they decide they're going to make a band. What is extraordinary, of course, is that there are so many different versions of the conundrum that constitutes music, you mm -hmm, know? Yep. And, it's, and here's the Grateful Dead, you know, all of whom play kind of individually, yet somehow or other manage to play together. And have done so for so many years, so successfully, it completely blows my mind. And I've got a T-shirt, I can't remember what it says, but it says something like 2,875 songs, you know, <laughs> uh, 3,760 gigs. Or so just extraordinary, the just the sheer level of work and creativity that was involved and the space that they gave one another to uh, to play and to be. Um, I don't think we'll ever see the like of it again, but you never never say never, but I've seen a lot of jam bands around and not one of them comes anywhere close to uh, to uh, the Grateful Dead, that's for sure. Was it, uh, I mean, how much of it had to do with just the idea that they were, I mean, probably more than any jam band, they were, the airplane probably did it as well, but I mean, the fact that they were really uh, learning to play individualistically, but together on every night on acid, on LSD, and those, and, and, and how much of that has to do with the fact that it's just going to be hard to ever c come close or ever get to a point where you're going to have a band like that. I mean, how much of the LSD, can you attribute the LSD to pretty much their, ability to never play the same song once never say the you said 
can you tri- attribute LSD to their ability to never play the same song once? Yeah, right. I mean, that's yeah. what you just said. I rather like that. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I mean, because that's what I mean. Lesh, that was part of the Lesh said that that the band never played the same song once, and you just said I've seen a lot of jam bands, and they kind of it's going to be hard to come up to the to the level. And I just look at it. And yeah, I, I mean, there's a combination of things that make a band. Right, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the drugs they're taking sure is one contributory factor, I'm sure. But I mean, what also is a contributory factor is, is you know, the people that are involved. Here's some amazing musicians that gave one another, you know, a lot of space to play the way in which they wanted to play. You know, I mean, then I never saw them have fights over music, man. You know. Sometimes the people would, you know, one person in the band might think that somebody else's playing was a bit strange or wherever they took it. But <laughs> the Grateful Dead were always interested in weird, strange, different, you know, and would, you know, love it if, if a Phil or a Bobby or a Jerry, for that matter, um, you know, tried to take the music in a different direction. Everybody would immediately jump on it and say, "Yay, we're going in a new, you know, a new direction. Fabulous! Let's uh, support this." You know, very supportive of one another, and uh, amazing musicians. And uh, yeah, of course, they produced they produced, uh, they produced a whole genre of music that to, to this day is quite extraordinary. Really, if you think about the effect that it's had on the wider United States, it got got a bloody uh, radio station that just plays their music. I don't think there's any other band maybe, you know, that could that, that you could do that with that have produced enough music that all you need to do is just play their music. Right. Who would you do that with? You, 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 because, and, I, and, and this is the other fascinating, I mean, you look at a band like the Allman Brothers, uh, you know, their sound, uh, even with the loss of uh, uh, Dwayne tragically and, and uh, uh, Barry Oakley, you know, their sound didn't change markedly, but the dead sound just kept evolving. And some of that had to do with the fact that they kept changing keyboard players, uh, things like that. But I mean, it, it, the, you know, but but we could go off on this. I, you know, I did catch a picture online with you and a, and a guy who's yet to come around to Jake Feinberg. And I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about, I saw this picture of you and him, and I wanted you to talk about... Uh, uh, Steve Parrish, uh, you know, the guy to yeah. me, the, 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 the roadies, um, you know, Barlow dubbed them the neo cocaine cowboys, uh, you know, a lot of, they were, they like where the dead were so tender and loving and open and supportive Mickey Hart's idea. Like, well, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. You know, the music, it was all about the music. Uh, they had this, this very, uh, what it seems to me to be almost a shield, which was this 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 crew, and you were right there to see these cats sort of evolve from the living in the back seat of a car into becoming a full on entourage. And I wanted you to talk specifically about Parrish and and uh, maybe when you first met him and how they grew and just break that down. Yeah, well, I mean, a band like the you know the Grateful Dead, like, like all the Allman Brothers for that matter, or the band. Uh, you know, the Rolling Stones, all these people, you know, are only, um, you know, as strong as the people who, in a sense, support them. And the people that immediately support the band are the crew. I mean, it's a hell of a job, man. You know, it's, it's exhausting. I mean, I just don't understand how people can do it other than the fact that they love the music. And that's the thing about the Great for Dead crew. The Great for Dead put up with a bunch of stuff from their crew that... Um, you know, maybe they shouldn't have got away with, who knows, but the one thing that was a certain certainty was that the crew loved the band's music and did everything in their power to support that, you know, and to make the guys on stage feel safe, secure, you know what I mean, be in a happy space. These are all um, difficult things to achieve, you know. It's hard to put your finger on why they should have... Um, why they should have been so successful, but one of the reasons they have, they've been so successful, Paris in particular, was that they were loyal, man. Can you give an example? Deeply, deeply loyal people. Well, you know, Steve looked after Jerry for years, mm-hmm. man. You know, looked after everything for him, you know, and uh, as I did when I was his tour manager, we loved the man, you know. If you love somebody, then you go to bat for him, don't you? You know, Steve did it like Ramrod did it, um... All, all those guys, you know, they 
day, day in and day out, humping, you know, tons and tons of equipment. Very, very hard work. And, uh, yeah, once in a while they were bad temper, but I think they were, you know, one of the greatest crews that you could ever imagine. And, of course, you know, the, the, the musicians relied upon them. Did I mean, you, that's did what you, happens, you know? I, I guess, Mike, the better question is that, that, and I think I know the answer, but, like, uh, did they did they respect you for your craft, it, the, the, especially the roadies? I mean, those cats were not academic cats, but they were very tough and they were smart. I, I only say this because Richard Loren really said that, um, you know, they really he really felt like he they treated him like shit. It basically, a he guy, was a, well good because he was a shit anyway. <laughs> You know I mean, mean, he got exactly what he deserved. I was always treated with ultimate respect by the crew. Was it because, do you think that Richard was arrogant about his chops as a quote-unquote business cat, and, and therefore they just hated that, and you were not arrogant? I mean, how how can you, because he really just said I that, looked after the crew. Right. I looked after the crew just like, like I looked after the band. What is looking after, now, what does I, that I mean? What, what the, does looking after the crew mean, though? What does that mean? making sure that, you know, at the end of a long day, at 3.30 in the morning, I send the limousines back to the gig to get them from the gig and bring them home in some kind of style to the hotel. I did. Making sure they got food at gigs, making sure if they got a problem, that there's, you know, they can come and talk to me and I'll help them sort it out. And I sorted out a shitload of problems for the crew. Zippy Loren, what could he fucking do? Wanker. <laughs> <laughs> I love. I'm so, I love Loren, but man, Cutler, it is so refreshing to talk to an honest, honest cat. Can you? Well, you know, it's like look, look. You know, I mean, he was just part of a, you know, what, the political game around the Grateful Dead. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like, um, I I never played that game. I did. I did my work. I made the Grateful Dead a shitload of money long before Zippy Loren ever came on the bloody scene. You know, and uh, yeah, then uh, I, I left, and then he took over. I, you know, and what did he do? He gave all the gigs to one promoter. What's so fucking smart about that? Uh, yeah, John Shear, right? Another one of your favorites. Right. Yeah. So, what was smart about that? Where was the great business brain on that thing? You know what I mean? Hello. Why? Why did you? Two two part question. Why did you leave? And do you feel like? Uh, I know that I, you know. I saw on this on this 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 you know this wonderful trip that you're on right now. You know, I saw you pictures with uh, with Bobby and maybe Barlow. But yeah. do you still like? Because with Loren, with uh, Zip uh, Zippy, uh, mm. I mean, when he got bounced out in '81, that was it. I mean, the door shut from the yeah. from that. And and do you do you still what, was the door shut for you, or do you still remain? in some kind of contact with members of the band? Oh, I've remained in contact with those people ever since. They've got, they got nothing, uh, they got no complaints with me, mate. I made them millions. That's right. And got paid nothing. You got paid nothing? Never, you got paid nothing? Nothing. Shit, nothing. You got it. But, uh, you know, I never worked for anybody. I worked, did what I did because I loved people. That's what I was doing. You know, I worked for the Rolling Stones, same thing. I work for them because I love their music, you know. You don't have enough money to pay me. So, hmm. you know, these are different things. Somebody like Lorraine, you know what I mean? I don't know. You know what I mean? I don't want to slack the guy off. It's just, you know, it's just something completely different, man. I don't, you know, I've never dealt with that kind of person, you know, not on a kind of like a friendship kind of level. And uh, I don't know, you know, you'd have to have a look at it. You know, I, I wasn't around when he was got when they got rid of him. Him, no, but they definitely parted ways in a big, uh, in a big uh, way, didn't they? Well, I mean, yeah. The story there is that, uh, uh, well, Kreutzmann threw him up against the wall in Europe and accused him of stealing money, and then uh, had him fired. You know, listen, I, I the, the uh, um. Can you talk about the, the, to me? This is this is almost where you the rubber meets the road with Sam Cutler. I, I, please take us through your involvement in Europe '72. I mean, the the double album was released, and then this incredible CD, Hundred Years Hall. That was you, man. I got to believe the connections, all the European yeah. connections, were you. Please 
Take us through. Yeah, uh, so break it down, man, because this is this is where the dead, as far as I'm concerned, uh, moved morphed into the the band that we know. Well, I mean, the thing is, that you must remember that before we went to Europe, right? We did we done Jesus, I don't know, two hundred and fifty odd gigs, maybe even three hundred gigs in uh, America, <clears throat> and we set up going to Europe, especially we did a tour of America before we went there, so that when the band arrived in Europe, they were like cooking, you know what I mean? Right. Really hot, they were playing playing as well, if not better than they'd ever played in their life, but I, um, they wanted to go to Europe, the Jerry wanted to, everybody did, you know, the idea of like playing for people who didn't understand the lyrics of the songs, you know what I mean? And had never heard the band's music, it was a challenge. And they were up for it, and so I went to Europe and got the whole thing together. I, I, every date that was organised by me, the money was all collected by me. I'm not, you know, to my own, own horn, but that's the fact of the matter. And uh, it was a great tour. I mean, if there was anything wrong with the tour, Jerry con constantly complained about he wasn't playing enough. Jerry was a guy who never liked, you know, having days off on the road. You know, he felt like a spare prick at the wedding. What was he going to do? He wanted to play. <laughs> so, so there you, were days. You, yeah, yeah, you had. So, I mean, how did? Because I, you know, later on in his career, that often lent itself to uh, tremendous amounts of substance abuse uh, overkill. Um, but how did mm -hmm. you? How did you entertain him? Uh, how did you keep him stimulated? You had a couple of days off at a time. How did you keep him stimulated? Well, there was Europe. See, I mean, Europe was indescribably strange for them all. They'd all been, you know, living in the Grateful Dead bubble. Right. So going to Europe was great for them because it was like naturally interesting. It was so weird. You know, no one speaks English for a start, <laughs> so that makes it all kind of a bit like a kind of uber acid trip if you like, you yeah. know what I mean? Off you, <laughs> off you go onto the streets of, you know, Hamburg or uh, London, well, not London, but Hamburg or Copenhagen or Paris, and it becomes a little mini mini adventure for you. So, you know, Jerry, Jerry had lots of fun. He, uh, he, he really liked the fact that England was, uh, that Europe, rather, was so old. Right. He loved all that, the old buildings, and, you know, uh, Europe is all the things America is not, in a way. Do you feel it's changed? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm curious. I just talked to, uh, well, I interviewed uh, great horn player Dave Liebman, who was um, w was with Miles actually when you were, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, he he says that. I mean, he makes like he he makes most of his living now still, and most of his his compadres in Europe. He said it's, right. but but he said it's changing though. Politics and economics. Do you feel it's changing too? Because. I mean, it adheres to all the, the craft and taste that you and I, even though I've actually never been there, uh, that I, I just aspire to. It's the uh, the appreciation of legacy and the the uh, the appreciation of just indigenous stuff. Um, but do you feel? I know I know you don't live there now, but is is it changing? It's changing. Everything changes, man, constantly. But I mean, you have to remember there are certain kind of what you call it, underpinnings of Europe, of Europe, you know, one of which is kind of European musical culture. You know, it goes everywhere from, you know, Bach to Stockhausen, you know, there's this huge pool of of uh, classical music. Those, you know, so you go to a country like Holland, little country, it's got maybe 30 different um, uh, symphony orchestras. It's got, you know, um, just huge amount of, of, of live music, albeit classical, but huge amount of jazz. Most of the great jazz players who could barely make a living in uh, America, you know, in the 40s at the end of the Second World War, they all went and, and you know, received a really warm welcome in uh, in Europe. So it's a nice place to, to be, you know, if you're a painter or a writer or a, a musician, you know what I mean? It's a, it, you feel kind of naturally um, embraced by by the culture, you know, like in America, in a funny way, if you're a rock and roller, you play for rock and rollers. You're not playing for all of America, you know, in a strange way, you know what I mean? You're Absolutely. playing for a Absolutely. sub group of America. In Europe, it's more the case that you you might be playing for virtually everybody. It's, it's very well put. Actually, and you also uh, are uh, treated like a professional and you're compensated for it. Uh, 
uh, which is nice. I mean, you know, th- which is now mm. different than what's happening here with where with a you know not everywhere, but there's a there's a you play for the door now, or there's a pay to play mentality. If you're playing jazz, I think. Um, I'm curious though, Sam. I mean, I, I I'm fascinated. Did, did the when when you were on, when you were uh, with the Dead, um, and they were playing Bills with uh, the Miles Davis Quintet. Mm. Did, did did do you do you believe that they were? Uh, I, I noticed with the, with the period of time I listened to with the Dead, it's just they were so established. But at the same time, they there was a stage presence that they brought. And I always look back on this time, and I I wonder if you knew if those guys ever. Um, articulated what they learned or what they what it was impressive to them about Miles's groups because they were playing the same bills. I mean, I know that. I mean, you got to. I, I got to believe those cats were on the side of the stage watching that group. Oh, they loved it. Yeah, of course, man. I mean, Miles loved the Grateful Dead too. He did. I mean, one of the reasons. Yeah, sure. He loved the Grateful Dead. Man. He loved the Grateful Dead because who knows what was going to happen. <laughs> you play what you know. You play what you feel. Sure. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. And like Miles always says, you know, the notes are only 30% of it. 70% of it is, you know, what's in the heart right, and how I you feel, it. you know what I mean? And, I dig, and, I dig. And, and um, so they, in a sense, you know, whilst they played different styles of music, in a sense they they were very similar, you know, in so far as, as who know, you know, I mean, the guys that have played with Miles have always said, you know, as soon as you get up on stage with Miles, who knows where it's going to go? That's right. You, he could tell you the History. he could tell you the set list, and then he'd start yeah. uh, on a different tempo. He'd change it. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, exactly. Change it. Change the key. So, you know, start a song. Of, everyone was agreeing it's going to start in D, and suddenly he just started in C or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, because he liked to keep things uh, loose and creative, and uh, yeah, and, and and experimental. I mean, that's why he loved the Grateful Dead, and I mean, that's what the Grateful Dead loved. They didn't want to just sit there. No, you know, they're not like the Rolling Stones sitting there play the same set list, you know, time after time. That wasn't what the Go for Dead were about at all. The Go for Dead were about having musical fun. Right. I'm just, to me, this it's intoxicating to know that uh, Miles, as far as you know, they never really, jam- did they jam together ever? I mean, did Jerry ever come out and play with Miles at all or anything like that? <laughs> Well, I, most of the time I was busy counting money or arguing <laughs> with promoters or, you know, helping I, would, I mean, Cutler, I just, yeah, or, I mean, this is like, I, I, would, mean, I love that you were, like, marinating in this and just, I mean, again, that was your job, but, but I just, go ahead, I didn't mean to cut you off, I love that you were... No, counting, no, no, yeah. it's just, it's just like, you know, the role, I mean, a lot of people misunderstand the role of the tour manager. Tour managers, you know... Got a lot of things to do at a live gig. One of which is to make sure that here's a band called the Grateful Dead or the Rolling Stones, whoever it might be. You know, their name's on a poster. They've invited people to come and listen to them play, and the people have paid money to do that. You know, there's some responsibilities involved. You know what I mean? You don't want to invite people to to a bum trip. You know, you want them to be in a in a hall where the sound is good. You know, where the security is not heavy-handed. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Where uh, where the cops are properly briefed, you know, where the, if there's, heaven forbid, there's an accident and a fire breaks out or whatever, people can safely get out of the building. There's a lot of things that, you know, tour managers have to take care of if they're good tour managers. And a lot of those things, nothing ever happens. You know what I mean? The gig goes off, it's all successful. And I mean, nobody died. No one, you know, the building didn't burn down. Uh, people could get out of the building at the end of the show because the doors weren't chained shut. All these little things that that uh, a tour manager makes sure has happened that you know collectively builds up to a successful gig. Um, yeah, so no, I you know, no, I, I mean that's and that to me, I, mean, the I music used to spend is... maybe a third of my time at a gig actually on stage. Sure. Sure. There was equipment guys to deal with all the equipment. You know what I mean. We were the band could deal with when they wanted to play or not wanted to not want to play. I mean, sometimes they might have ten minutes just stand around smoking a joint or something. You know, need to have a break. <laughs> but that was the Grateful Dead for you. I mean, everybody understood that about the Grateful Dead and was quite relaxed about it. You know. Um, Sam Cutler, decorated uh, tour manager for so many luminary bands. Um, uh, 
the new riders of the Purple Sage. Um, mm-hmm. uh, have you caught up with the wily David Nelson on this New York? On this, I have. I had a lovely evening with Nelson. He Nelson, I mean, talk about. I mean, I'm looking for. Nel- I want yeah. to talk to Nelson badly. But the thing is, like that group. I mean, you Jerry was playing the most ridiculous pedal steel. Dave Torber. Yeah. On, talk about your involvement with that group, and then ultimately, um, I'm always confused because. Uh, Seemed like Mickey was trying to be the drummer, but he couldn't really keep time. So they brought Spencer Dryden in, and that's another cat. You mentioned Charlie Watts, but I was going right. to. And Spencer Cor- is cool, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing is about the new riders, they kind of evolved. They wanted to play around with the Grateful Dead. I mean, <coughs> Marmaduke and Jerry knew one another for years, you know. Um, sure. So, you know, it became too much for Jerry. Jerry loved it. He loved me playing the pedal steel, then doing an acoustic set, and then an electric set. Shit, we had shows that went on for like eight hours, man. You know what I mean? It was just like, yeah, incredible. But, you know, it's a huge ask yeah. for Jerry. You know what I mean? There's a lot of work, and he did love it. But in the end, uh, Chesley and I, my partner Chesley and I, got um, Buddy Cage on uh, pedal steel. He was Ian and Sylvia's pedal steel player in Canada. Great speckled great. bird. Yeah, the great speckled yeah. bird. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Great player, great player. You know, Talbot on bass. And then, uh, yeah, they had to have their own drummer, really, because, yeah, Mickey's, you know, whatever else you say about Mickey, he's not a country and western, you know, or a country drummer. Yeah, so, I, mean, I mean, I look at him, the more and more I listen, he was a tribal percussionist. Uh, he had some sort yeah, he's of... a percussionist, exactly. Right, I mean, he... he got, yeah, because Steve, I mean, Steve Barncard really, said that he really he could not keep time with the new riders, and they just had to find they had to bring Spencer in. Yeah, I mean Billy could have done it because he's that kind of drummer. You know what I mean? It's like you know he's a drummer that keeps the rhythm going and moving along and keeps it all flowing and keeps everyone happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mick is a punctuation drummer. Believe me, those punctuations can open new portals. But I mean, just to be clear, no, absolutely. Yeah, 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 but yeah, he, yeah, needs, yeah. he needs a Billy with him. He's one, you know, he's a pair of, like, Billy can drum on his own with the Grateful Dead and did very successfully for quite a few years. You know, and then when Mickey joins, it becomes, of course, another thing, you know. But nonetheless, it's vital to the Grateful Dead and how they are that Billy's there. Absolutely. I, I wanted you to talk about Mark Car- Caran. Car- can you talk about this? Yeah. Talk, please talk about Well, this. I love him. I mean, he played with Bobby for years in Rat Dog, and he's going to be playing this coming Saturday. Uh, on the day I think this this uh, interview is being broadcast. Absolutely. At uh, Sweetwater. Um, it's his birthday, and there's several other people who are coming along to share their birthday. So it's going to be a fun evening. I'm looking forward to it. I said to him, I'd be the MC because he's an old mate. I like him. He's got an attitude, you know. He's like, he's not the greatest guitar player in the world, but he's a great showman, you know, and he puts his heart and soul into it. So it's going to be a good, good gig. I'm hoping that a lot of people will kind of rock up and enjoy it. Rock so up. So Saturday night. Uh, yeah, no. At the, at the Sweetwater. Mark's a, he's a rocker. Um, I'm only calling him a when rocker. Did you, when did you first connect with him originally? God, I don't know now. I'm getting old, you know. I can't remember. No, you're pretty since, sharp, man. I, I don't think... Uh, I don't five think or six heard. years ago it would, okay. be, it would be, I mm-hmm. guess, something like that, yeah. When he was playing with Rat Dog. Um, one final question before you, Mr. Cutler, sure. uh, and yeah, sure. uh, we'll do part three when you get back to, to Australia. But um, <laughs> but uh, uh, what has been the most depressing thing about coming back to the, to the United States, and what has been the most uplifting thing for you uh, on this trip? Okay. Yeah, I don't I don't get depressed. I, I got somebody calling me. I don't get depressed. The whole thing has been fun. It's it's been uh, real fun and. Uh, I'm enjoying it no end. That's beautiful. So, I mean, maybe shocked? Do you ever get shocked? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just enjoying it. <laughs> I love it. I yeah, there's not fight. much you haven't seen. I mean, I realize that, that right. you know, you've seen it all. So, um, uh, so um, love always, Mr. Cutler. We will run Thank you. a segment of this uh, on my Saturday broadcast uh, from... Um, and I'll let you know, probably one thirty to 2 Pacific time. So we, we will, Lovely. We'll, we'll, cool. co- we'll coordinate on uh, that. And um, I should just say one thing. Go ahead. I haven't seen it all, man. That's a, that's absolutely not the case. I haven't seen it all. And I'm constantly seeing new stuff, you know, whether it's a little band or whether it's seeing Jack Elliott do something, you know. Uh, seeing Nelson, I went and visited with David Nelson's band. Brilliant. I mean, 
one of the greatest bands, just hot, hot band. I loved it, and I uh, managed to introduce them to a friend of mine, Aboriginal man from Australia, who played in the didgeridoo in the uh, dressing room. Oh, I love so it. So they all loved that, you know. So, yeah, we're, we're having fun. And every day's a new day, and uh, every day above ground's a, a bonus. What, do you, what is your... Uh... What have you been eating? What have you been enjoying eating out there? Oh, we go to... I like Chinese restaurants. <laughs> so we go to Garcia's favorite Chinese restaurant. What was that? Chris, what was Chrysanthemum that? in San Rafael. Why? Is it, is it Western Chinese or is it Sichuan's? I mean, yeah, it, Western yeah, Chinese. Yeah, right. I love yeah, it. Right. No, let's get to... Listen, how long are you in the States for, by the way? We don't know, is the honest answer. A couple of months. Can you possibly come to, come to Arizona? Not this time. I doubt it because we've got to go. We're now, yeah, we're busy. I've got to go down to Los Angeles, then we're going to the East Coast where a friend of mine's getting married. I must get off this phone because somebody's trying to call me. Cheers, man. Yeah, much love to you, Cutler. All right, but no problem. And and nice to talk to you. We'll do it again. All right, brother. Love always. Take care. Okay, bye. Bye bye. Thanks, sir. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Thanks to Jackson Craft. He got here. We'll see you in a little bit.